ADHD hasn't really changed. It's uh, sometimes people uh, will say, you know what, is it just a contemporary set of issues? Is it the too much screens? Is it poor parenting? Is it all these other different reasons? And I would say no to that. I would say that uh, children with ADHD have been in school settings for a long time. Um, the children haven't changed, but we could argue, I think, uh, very effectively uh, that school systems have changed. And indeed, um, we know that school demands have increased, uh, starting with our very uh, lowest grades in kindergarten, which are now whole day kindergartens, where even just a few generations ago, it might have been half day uh, with no academic demands embedded in it. Now we're asking kindergartners to persist through an entire school day where they're uh, working on uh, reading, writing, uh, math concepts. All those things are, are, are good, uh, but we also have to consider the developmental level of the kids that we're asking to meet all of these demands. And I think that's one place where we see a little more friction these days in schools with respect to behavior. I also think it's important when we're going to be talking about some more positive behavioral supports in these next slides. Some people have said to me, you know what, uh, th those seem like things everybody should do. They're not that important. But I'm going to uh, spend uh, just two minutes here before we move to intervention to, to really help us all put ourselves in the shoes of a child with ADHD. And I think it's important because I'm going to emphasize that we need to be more positive with, with uh, students with ADHD as we support and work with them. And here's why. Let's think about just a single morning in the life of a student with ADHD. And let's pretend it's, it's morning time and they're just about ready to get woken up by a caregiver. And this caregiver uh, maybe uh, went to a talk and uh, they heard, you know, I'm supposed to be really positive with my child. And so they come in with a, a smile and they say, rise and shine, today's gonna be a great day. Get up and get ready for school. And the child, instead of smiling back or getting out of bed, pulls the covers over their head and says, I'm not going to school, I hate school, you can't make me. And the parent says, well, you have to get up. And then they go and start to get ready with their day, maybe get the other sibling, uh, start to get ready. And they come back and the child's still in bed. And now uh, that smile is not quite as bright. And they say, come on, this is gonna be a great day. It's time to get started. I laid out your clothes, get ready for school. Uh, and I'll have a nice breakfast for you downstairs. And they leave and they continue to do their morning routine and they come back and the child's still not out of bed. So now the smile's gone, right? They're grabbing the child by the ankles and pulling the child out of the bed and saying, come on, you have to get ready, uh, get dressed for school. And they come back in a few moments and the child maybe has one sock on and a half a pant leg and they're playing with a toy in the corner. And now the parent says, you need to get ready. Let's go, get going. And eventually a child goes through the morning routine, comes down to breakfast and their sister's sitting across from them at the table reading a magazine and the child reaches for that magazine impulsively and spills orange juice all over the table and all over the sister. And now the parent knows that they're going to be late and they have to take the, child, the sister upstairs, get them changed. And you can see the thermometer, thermometer temperature start to rise uh, in this parent. And now they're heading down to the bus stop and they're already uh, mentioning the child, you better behave yourself at this bus stop. You're kicking the gravel all over uh, all the other parents and uh, children at that bus stop the other day. I got a lot of dirty looks, just stand still. And wouldn't you know it, there's a big pile of gravel that's awfully tempting. And as soon as they walk to the corner, that gets th uh, kicked all over the place. And all the parents, the kids shuffle off physically away from this parent standing at the bus stop. And it doesn't end here, right? They, uh, the child gets on the bus and the bus driver saying good morning to one child, good morning to the next. And then this child walks on the step and, the, and they don't get a good morning. They get, you, you're sitting right behind me today because yesterday you were hopping from seat to seat to seat. That's dangerous. You're gonna sit right behind me. And really the first seat of the bus isn't where this child's supposed to sit. That's not where the peers are sitting. That's where the kindergartners sit. And so all throughout the bus ride, this child might be getting teased or bullied by the other kids for not sitting back in the middle of the bus where classmates are sitting. And it doesn't end there, right? They walk up the bus and the bus aide says, before the child even has a chance to walk, you better walk today. And then they get to the classroom and instead of sitting down and doing their bell work, they're uh, busy um, maybe checking out the turtle in the back of the classroom. They haven't taken off their backpack or hung up their coat. And uh, the teacher's first comment to the child is not a good morning or how are you today? But hey, you better sit down. You're not going to have enough time to finish your work. And that's just one morning, right? Extrapolate that across a six hour day, five days in a week, uh, four weeks in a month. 10 months in a school year for all of school. It's no wonder that the interventions that we try for a day or two don't make a dent in some of the behavior we're trying to address. And so I will argue for really intensive, long-term sustained intervention as we talk about these different approaches. 
So when we talk about classroom interventions, before I talk about specific interventions for students with ADHD, I think it's really important to say that the classroom itself generally should have really strong behavioral supports in place. This includes really clear and um, specified classroom rules and structure for particular activities. Uh, what's expected uh, when we walk in the hall versus when we're in the cafeteria versus when we're in small groups uh, working on academic content. Uh, where's my assigned area? Am I, uh, a teacher could define uh, where I'm supposed to sit or be during independent seat work versus small group work versus maybe uh, free time. Uh, Educators, uh, as longer the longer I'm in the field, I think the stronger educators are getting in this area of ignoring mild inappropriate behavior. So I used to see a lot of emphasis on trying to get children to sit on their bottom, face forward, not move a muscle when they're in the classroom. Uh, I don't think we're putting kids through school to teach them how to be good sitters, right? We really want them to be good at reading, writing, and arithmetic. And so if a child has to stand or kneel or maybe squirm around a little bit, but they're attending, they're producing the work, uh, teachers keeping their eye on the prize that the academic content is being learned, uh, that's the most important thing. And so we can ignore some of those more minor things. Uh, we also can think about pre-MAC contingencies. So, uh, this is how I get my paycheck, right? When I work for a week, then I get a paycheck. We can do the same sort of thing in classrooms. When you complete this assignment, then you can go uh, to the rug for free time. Those kinds of pre-med contingencies are highly effective for kids with ADHD. And then we'll talk about some of these classroom interventions that you can use like daily report cards that uh, I, I would argue every child with ADHD should have in place. So, to summarize about tier one, we really should have mostly positive approaches. If you look at this pyramid, uh, the foundation is just being a really genuine, positive, nice person to, with the child. Listen to them, uh, get to know them, learn about their perspective, learn about who they are as a person and what their family's like and what their goals are and, and what their uh, likes and dislikes are. Uh, encourage them. There should be liberal praise and encouragement. There should be all kinds of rewards and celebrations. In fact, the students right now in school are running a deficit in rewards and celebrations because for about two years, our whole society said, don't go near anyone else, don't have birthday parties, don't uh, go to holidays. And so uh, we need to reduce that deficit by celebrating success even more. Uh, things like uh, commands, demands, reprimands should be used sparingly, and consequences like office referrals or calls home should really not be used hardly at all if they're effective, and they won't be needed if the child wants to stay in that bottom part of the pyramid where all the positives are happening. Unfortunately, we do know that the reality is not quite the same as that pyramid I showed you. So we've done some studies, and there have been other studies that have looked at rates of praise in uh, American classrooms. And uh, the best you ever get in your whole entire life, when you look at the ratio of commands, demands, reprimands, corrective feedback, the negatives compared to the positives, like I'm proud of the way that you completed that on time, or I really like the way that you helped out your friend, uh, the best it ever gets is in kindergarten, you get, uh, it's still a negative ratio, but there's about uh, two commands, demands, reprimands for every praise statement. Throughout your development, though, uh, the ratio gets leaner. So you get the commands, demands, reprimands stay pretty stable. In fact, go up a little bit. The praise gets less. And this is a big problem. Remember that child I told you about in the morning that's just getting yelled at, commented upon, uh, coaxed, prodded, uh, corrected all throughout the day. Uh, that child, the child with uh, challenging behavior, needs many more praise statements and attaboys or girls than probably all the other students in the class combined, because we have to counteract all these negatives that are getting dumped on the kid from all the other places. And if that's the only thing you take away from this uh, talk today, I'll be happy about that, that we should be complimenting and pointing out the good things about children with challenging behaviors so much more, because that's what's going to help keep them motivated to continue to produce. And, and I'm a, an optimist. I've never met in my entire career a child with uh, ADHD that showed up and said, you know what, I really want to fail today and do a bad job. That's never happened to me. And I've worked with lots and lots of kids, lots of different places. They've always shown up wanting to be part of the group, successful, do a good job, uh, experience the, the, the good feelings inside of following through on something they were asked to do. And so 
that being the case, I think it's our job as educators to figure out how do we continue to maintain that positive momentum.